hi again, Michael. Hello. Um, in our last chat, we were talking about your work at the Globe um, with this, the university students who came over from America, R Rutgers, R Rutgers University. Rutgers yeah. University. And uh, you, you said you spent, well, in fact, you did an amazing array of Shakespeare plays, didn't you? And uh, um, including Troilus and Cressida, which kind of startled me. And maybe at some point we can have a chat about that, whether it's on camera or off, doesn't really matter. But it's such an extraordinary play. I love it. It's an amazing play. Yeah. Amazing. Um, I suppose the thing, to say sorry? About, the thing to say about Shakespeare, every play is so different. It is extraordinary. You cannot, but, and he's exploring the whole time how to use language and so. I mean, you know, extraordinary. And, you know, you just think, oh, another world. And, you know, yeah. it's amazing. Man. <laughs> Actually, while we're sort of being a little bit discursive, um, question that I wanted to put to you at some point, and I'll put it to you now, is that you've never done a Greek play. No. Years and years and years ago, when I was out of work, when I'd come back from America, and trying to get jobs, I can't remember how this came about, but the RSC was doing some sort of workshop project. They were going to look at all the Greek plays. And I met one of the company directors then, whose name I've forgotten, although I can see his face, very nice man. And I went away and read the entire canon of, you know, Aeschylus and Euripides and Sophocles. I read them all. And the translations were always a problem, you know, but there were some, he, Eon or Iron is wonderful. So plays I didn't know. Um, the, uh, Heracles is wonderful. I mean, very Iphigenia uh, in in an oh. is is quite wonderful, and they're funny and sour. I mean, Euripides I love because he's witty and ironic and sour and you know, and the, and great. Um, so I, I I read them all. And nothing happened at the RSC. That was another one of those things that came to zilch to nothing. And over the years, I've often thought, shall I do, do one? And there was something about, they need a lot of people. Am I going to use a chorus? And what would, what would that mean? And who would the chorus be? And can I afford to have a chorus? And, you know, and I don't know, for various reasons, I never quite followed through. And also, I thought... I need a translation, and it's 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 so remote this language for me that I'm going into another world which I can't even begin to relate to or even read. Do you know? Uh, when I did the Chekhov, at least I could sort of start to learn the Cyrillic alphabet and so forth. But you know, um, it was I don't know. I partly fear, partly not quite sure and you know they had a very clear idea about the gods that they're really aspects of ourselves you know that are our weaknesses and our foibles and so forth really and it all sort of made sense and they were exciting you know and they were great stories wonderful you know and uh, amazing um but i never did one one no well it's never too late no um I'd need to meet up with somebody who knew about Greek plays who I could consult because they are even more up-to-date things. They say, you know, from the such and such great uh, gate across the such and such seas to the horizon of the mountains comes. And you're thinking, do we need all that, that description of, you know, geographical detail? You know, it obviously had references for an audience, but it doesn't now. And do you, you know, it's just things like that. I just felt it, it was, I guess it's laziness, the amount of research. Mm. And mm. I've never come across a book which enlightened me. I did find a wonderful book and made um, Aristophanes very immediate. Really got me excited for a while. But 
then there's always this problem of trying to find modern, you know, uh, <coughs> of what's happening in those plays. And they're, again, they're very witty and outrageous and so forth. No, but for, for one reason or another, I didn't. There's a lot of people, I've never done Beckett, I've never done Strindberg, I mean, you can go on and on, I've never done Racine, Racine. you know, I've, <laughs> there's yards of stuff. Moliere. I've done, I've done three Moliere, yeah, I've, I've, done some, yes, I've done Moliere, but, uh, you know, I've done Marivaux, who I think is quite wonderful. Um, no, I've got a very particular taste, and I know when something hits me. When, when I was deciding to do Cymbeline for shared experience the only other play I'd done was Hamlet years ago in a cut up version of Hamlet and Lambda and I was always frightened of Shakespeare and I read Cymbeline which was meant to be this messy discordant long peculiar play it made sense to me immediately God knows why you know so my taste is not popular shall we say but, um, you know, just just to be fair to you, you're not saying you're not saying that the Greeks were completely uh, blocked off to you. Oh, no, no, no. See. There wasn't that stimulation to see if I could re. It didn't take, carry me anywhere to 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 go further with them. So I didn't need the sort of stimulus or the excitement to you know to move them on, and. I, I guess I've seen quite interesting productions of them. I'm trying to think. Uh, Deborah Warner did a rather good, um, what was it? Uh, Electra, I think, with Fiona Shaw at the Riverside, you know, that was kind of good. And it didn't, I can't remember what she did with the chorus, with the uh, chorus. I'm getting a blurred here. I'm, I'm meandering. It's just you need to cut okay. all this. Let's 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 um, let's um, let's get to the main to the main topic of this chat, which is <coughs> your time. You get invited. Um, from what I gather, you get invited to, to do a job at the RSC. Yes, and it came about like this. I'm very friendly with a director called Lawrence Boswell, <coughs> who ran the Gate Theatre for a long time and he's a great aficionado of Spanish Golden Age plays and he did messes of them there and did very nice work and I liked his work and he did a guest production for me uh, for Method of Madness or oh, no, for, for Shared Experience at some point A Long Day's Journey into Night, very nice production and he had a connection with Michael Boyd, they were old mates from long and Michael Boyd had just become artistic director of the, um, the RSC. And Lawrence was going to do a season of three Golden Age plays within the context of the RSC. A bit like, you know, the, the structure that Peter Hall had for the National Theatre with having a director with his company within a smaller group. And he was going to do a production he asked me to do a production. He asked Nancy Meckler to do a production and a, another director to do a production. Simon or something. And he commissioned masses and masses and masses and masses of translations of this voluminous amount of literature. I mean, those writers, Calderon and, you know, Lope de Vega and so forth and so on, they just wrote and wrote and wrote and wrote, play after play after play after play, hundreds of them. And I read and... And Cervantes had written two plays. One is called The Siege of Numantir or something, which I'd already read somewhere. And this was called Pedro of whatever his town was, Pedro. And again, a wacky play, which I absolutely fell in love with. It's about a sort of con man who goes through life. And it was like a series of little set pieces with sort of connecting themes going along, along the way, but not a strong plot. It's just about him conning people and being diff and playing different characters with different people he met, you know. 
and it 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 covers sort of a local mayor and his entourage, and it's got shepherds, it's got a, a king in it. It, it goes on, it's got gypsies, and it was kind of, I thought, oh, this is going to be such fun to do, I want to do this one. And and Lawrence said to me, oh, I'm so pleased, because I like it too, I'm so glad you're doing that. So I did it, we, we called it Pedro the Great Pretender. And I, mine was the fourth show, and the season had got off to quite a nice start. But the actors were absolutely knackered. And of course, I, I was rehearsing with them in the time they had between their performances. And, and because it was a big company, they were all under studying and doubling, you know, so it was a bit of a... But they were great and they worked hard. And uh, had a lovely woman called Leah Hausman who did the, the dances with them. She's she's a movement teacher and choreographer. She now uh, uh, revives uh, opera productions at Covent Garden and so forth. She's a lovely woman, and really knows her stuff. And um, and uh, Alona Seikatch had been my you know my composer for most of my career. She'd done practically all the music except for the Globe. I. I asked if she wanted to come and work with me again, so she wrote a score for it. And it was going to be in The Swan. Yeah. And I'm taking a gap here because I cannot remember my designer's name, which is terribly well known, and um, I'm very embarrassed. We'll find it. And she was wonderful to work with because she took her time. We'd met, we'd go out for coffees, we'd go to galleries and look at paintings and art exhibits. And I wanted to not pre-design the show, but work with the actors in the space. So we decided we'd have a fairly clean stage, so a beautiful floor and some chairs. And we'd... Um, she dragged all the costumes she thought were appropriate out of the wardrobe, brought them into the rehearsal room, and the actors used to get dressed up, and she'd photograph them, and then she'd design from that, and it, and it was a lovely process of growing, and it was terrific, and I thoroughly enjoyed it. <clears throat> and But again, I, it was very bitty, and I had no idea of actually how I was going to stage it. It was interesting. And just before I started rehearsing, I always, at the last minute, I suddenly see how it'll go on the stage, just before I start rehearsals. And by chance, there is a Spanish film director. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, gosh. He's doing things like the tango, the blah, blah, blah. You know, he's taken... Um, he did a wonderful version of Blood Wedding. And he did one on flamenco. And I got the DVD. And I wasn't planning. I thought it would be interesting to see. And it was wonderful. It was a great big space in which a whole series of flamenco companies had gathered together to show each other their style of work. And he just filmed them in different ways, each company after another, in this big, big hall. And I thought, that's it. Every scene is going to be like another flamenco number. There's, all the actors are going to be on stage, sitting in chairs at one end of the, of the swan. And Pedro will announce each show. So it's like a series of numbers. And... It gave me a shape and a structure, and I showed it to the actors on the first day of rehearsal. You know, say, I thought this would be a nice structure for us. So each little scene, little event, is a number in itself. There's the gypsy number, there's the local village mayor and his corruption, so there's the king, you know, the crazy king, and, and so forth and so on. There's a very religious woman. And basically, uh, um, Pedro is 
either conning money out of them or trying to get them to do things for other people. You know, he's not malicious, he's just very inventive. And I got my lovely actor, John Ram, to be in it because all, all four of us directors had been involved in the casting, which was tricky, but we come to a nice, you know, uh, um, resolution. And so John Ram was in it and also very wonderful uh, Simon Trinder, who I worked with quite a lot. He'd been my puck at the Globe and he'd been in Philip's last play, uh, Buried Alive, which was when it was at Hampstead. And he it's so interesting. I'm going to make a little diversion to talk about actors here because he came into rehearsal. He was very young. He was just out of drama school, Welsh College, I think. And he came and he sat opposite me and he was so alert and so alive and so with me. And he said, oh, the play is this, isn't it? And it's that, and it's really nice. And I thought, I hope to God he can act because I just love this person. This is right. And he was terrific. And uh, he now is running his own schools. He still acts a lot, but he, he was so frustrated with directors that he set up his own school to counteract a lot of you know, bad teaching and so forth. He's a very special person, Simon Trinder. So this is my tribute to him because he's great. Mm -hmm. um, so he was also in the company. And um, we went on our way, we did our work, the actors were tired. I gave them a couple of days off once because I thought, they didn't ask for it. I said, look, I think you're so tired. And the stage management, and this is where the point I wanted to get to, I think, came up to me and said, why are you giving them time off? They're not paid for that. I said, they're exhausted. Well, they're actors. And I got the sense of this terribly self-satisfied institution which was reinforced all the time in a sort of high-handed way of dealing, quite different from my experience of the National Theatre. And I'm going to talk about the RSC now. I mean, it was then, but, you know, and it was, what, uh, 15 years ago. But um, you go into the wardrobe department to talk about, oh, we've got a lot of shows before yours, rather than with the National Theatre, you were the only person they were dealing with. And... I pick up a, a brochure and discovered I was going to do an after show talk or a before show talk and nobody consulted me. And I call that whatever the publicity or marketing department and say, but look, why didn't you talk? Oh, we thought it was simply to put a date down. You don't have to do it. I said, but if it's cancelled, it's you've cancelled something in my name. It was very high handed and I felt thoughtless about the people working there. I really did. And so, and and I thought, here I'm going to be in, in, a, in an atmosphere where a lot of other directors are around and we'll talk about theatre and it'll be creative and stimulating. How naive I was at the age of 70. It was all about bums on seats. Oh, the reviews were good. Oh, we've got bums on seats. And I found it very, dis well, totally disillusioning because I've never much admired what the ROC did except way back a couple of Peter Hall distant productions and some early productions of uh, Trevor Nunn. But, you know, because it was too big, it had this huge reputation. It was running three theatres. You know, it was touring. And, and it was trapped in its own structures, which it couldn't get out of. It had no flexibility. And, and I found it... Uh, and I know when Michael Boyd took over, I'm going to say this now, before I, Lawrence asked me to do the show, he took me out to lunch and said, look, you're one of the few people who's, who's created a sense of ensemble. I'd love you to be involved with the RSC. You know, I want to change things. And I said, well, I'd love to, Michael, thinking, well, oh. he said, we'll have to find a place for you. And I think, well, you well, couldn't ask me to do a production. He didn't. And nothing ever happened until Lawrence invited me. And anything less ensemble like existed and there were gestures I know in the bigger companies where they were doing stuff on the main stage <clears throat> um, 
they every so often have a teacher or a, or a movement coach or a voice coach or somebody come in for an afternoon and they were yanked out of their rehearsals to work with this person without any purpose. I remember an actor, actress who was in um, a Macbeth that was being rehearsed. She said, I don't know why. We have to stop what we're doing in order to deal with somebody who wasn't very good, which had nothing to do with the work we're doing, wasn't carried through. You know, so there's always lip service to classes and, and so forth and so on. Um, anyway, so I, I was a little cynical about it. Anyway, the show got very nice reviews in Stratford, and it was lovely in many, many ways. It was sort of buoyant. Um, we went to Madrid with, with it, with the whole with the whole the, with the whole ensemble. And I think mine was the first professional production of this play that's ever been done. And it got very warm ovation in Madrid. And afterwards a lot of professors of literature ran up and said, We knew it would work, we knew it could work <laughs> sort of thing. Anyway, so that was nice. And again I forgot to say that Philip did a translation for me. And it was great because Lawrence had this wonderful man whose name was Jack something, who's now died, who adored, he was quite old, but he had, and he cycled around London, and he adored this material, and he was a source of information which was fantastic. And he collaborated with me, he filled him with information, and he worked with Philip, and Philip tried to create the verse structures of the original which are very varied, you know, the stress is different, the forms are different, and created a very lively um, rhymed thing. So that was my sixth collaboration with Philip, which was lovely, you know, really nice. So we could work with each other under all sorts of, you know, him writing a play, uh, uh, um, devising a play together or translating. So that was lovely. So it had its nice moments as well. And it also came into London to the Playhouse Theatre, <coughs> And somehow it didn't quite click there because the space, it was a small proscenium stage, whereas there had been this thrust and there was something missing from it. It was all right. It didn't get quite the reviews it had got at Stratford, you know, and it's a bit disappointing. And um, that was it. I then got asked by Michael... No, by Lawrence again. Lawrence was going to do another season of three plays, this time Shakespeare, because they were going to do the whole the whole canon in one season. Whether I'd like to do a production, and it was two years later. And I'll tell you the saga because, well, it's interesting. <laughs> I think. It's sort of everything I hate about, the things I hate about theatre. <clears throat> and... He said, there's, there was a range of things. He said, would you like to do as you like it or... Um, the, much do about nothing. Mm. And I've always found as you like it very tricky because I do not understand the arguments between Feste and Jaquis. You know, this intellectual debate, there's something in it which just doesn't... I don't understand. It's also a long play, and I don't know. And I and I read much ado, and I thought, oh, that's kind of fun. Yes, I like that. Okay, and I had a very clear idea of how I'd do it because I'd also and I was and I thought I'll, and it, it was going to be done in in the autumn after I'd done my play for Rutgers because it was one of those productions that was parallel with the Rutgers work and I thought I can do much ado with them I could have a run through of the play to find out how it works and then that'll be really lovely so everything is going to be great you see and um, and I thought as an American and this I think I talked about this with Avengers Tragedy the American accents work with iambic pentameter very well you know, I think we ought to go and have some coffee. You know, it really would be nice if you could do, if you could say this thing to me, then I would find it much more natural. I don't know. So I thought, okay, I don't like moving things, but maybe this is a sort of mafia world. You know, because what's the battle they've come back from? You know, probably dealing with another mafia gang and so forth, you know, with rivals, you know, territory and so forth. And it seemed to make sense on all sorts of levels. You know, a sort of, you know, 1900s, sort of uh, early part of um, 
what was the trilogy, the wonderful film trilogy that Robert De Niro was first in and Al Pacino? The Godfather. It's sort of the, the very early, you know, 1900s mafia Sicily. You know, it takes me in Sicily. I thought, okay, let's have a go at that. that. And it was fine. The, the piece I did with the actors at the, and the students at the Globe was fine. Now, parallel with this, I had very nice meetings with the uh, casting director and I hadn't met... And Nancy was going to do this and, and Lawrence were going to do the other two shows. And Nancy was doing Romeo and Juliet and Lawrence said, I'm happy to do as you like it. Okay, well then things were moving on and I was never being told what was going on because originally with the actors we thought how can we cross cast and would it work and so forth and I was sent a schedule one day and there was no sign of as you like it but King John was there and I thought what the hell is that and Lawrence had been offered a film and had backed out and had, and the place had been taken by Josie who who used to who just finished running the Donmar? Josie. Okay, and she decided she wanted she didn't want to do as you like it. She wanted to do King John, and I thought, well, the casting nobody told me out of consideration, you know, and then I tried to get hold of the casting director, and he'd left the company. Nobody told me, and there was a totally new person. I talked to the literary manager, I can't remember what her name was, and I said, look, there's certain scenes I don't understand, I'd love to talk to you about, and could you let me have the cuts of previous productions? It'd be very interesting to see what other directors have cut. Yes, of course, nothing happened. Nothing happened. Um, I wanted to organise a designer, and they said, oh, well, you've got to wait because we're trying to figure out all the dimensions because we're doing the canon and it's such and such. So I felt I was being less and less communicated with all the time. And things were going on, which I, out of courtesy, if nothing else, I should have been told. And then again, I was negotiating my contract. And they paid me, I can't remember how much, to do um, Pedro the Great Pretender. I think it was for about five or six weeks' work, certain amount. Now they wanted me to be available for four months because of the way they were structuring the play. And they were offering me exactly the same money two years later. And I thought, no, this is ridiculous. So I said, you cannot possibly pay me to keep myself free for 16 weeks instead of six weeks, you know. And they upped it by like a thousand pounds. And I suddenly thought, fuck it, I do not want to work with a shitty company. You know, they're so arrogant. So, you know, I was really just, I mean, maybe it was me and I was unlucky, I don't know. But every sign was saying to me, Michael, why are you going to do this? You're going to have no cooperation. Uh, uh, the way you're going to rehearse is going to be broken up. The three shows are going to be rehearsed together rather than in sequence. Um, the, the casting is all muddled up. Yeah, the literary agent never came back to me with any of those scripts. I asked her for. You know, and I thought, well, they're so busy with themselves that they're actually not dealing with the people. And I I sent Michael Boyd an email saying, um, when we first met for lunch, you said <laughs> you wanted to create an ensemble. Well, all I can say to you, Michael, is since I've embarked on thinking about uh, this production of... Um, much ado. Much ado about nothing. I've never felt less part of a company in my entire career. This has not happened. This has not happened. Three days later, not immediately, three, I get a letter. Oh, never mind. Okay. Um, anyway, thank you. But on with the next. You know, it was, and I thought you're just a commodity. You know, it really was extraordinary. Mm. You know, this total. Mm, not, I'm so sorry, or can we do this, or, you know. And so I had to, you know, 
And I was so relieved I did it, and I'm still very happy. Mm. It might have changed my career if I stayed on another show at the RSC. I have no idea, but I thought, I don't want... No, at this stage in my life, I want to be happy. I want to feel I'm with people I can communicate with. And that was for me. Maybe it was coincidental. Maybe I was an unlucky victim of a whole series of sequences. But I felt I was just one on a list of millions of people who they might or might not contact periodically. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Their ambition leapt ahead of their ability to do, deal with things anyway. So, le voila. So that was my story with the RSC. And um, it yeah. reinforced a lot of, I felt, about big companies over the years. You know, but they're just too big to do. They do glossy work. You know, occasionally, of course, you get, because of the level of the people working there, you get an interesting production. But... Uh, there's often a heartlessness to them because they're not done in joy because they're done under pressure. That's not totally true of the national because I think everything's rehearsed separately and so forth and so on. But, you know, I, you know, I mean, whether it wants to or not, a big company doing a lot of shows does become a factory, inevitably. It's got a product, it's got schedules, you've got to fit into the schedules. And that's fine, obviously, up to a point, but then it becomes a straitjacket or it becomes something which is dominating everything else. You know, the, 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 you get stru st stuck in structures that you can't be flexible with. You know, and um, it's tough. It's a, it's a problem, you know, and uh, there it goes. You know, um, so that's my histoire at the Royal Shakespeare Company. Um, Good. The show itself was nice, and I'm glad I loved the material, and that was fun, you know. And um, it was a tour de force for John Ram, I thought. He was just terrific in it, so. Okay, Mike, um, we're going to bring this one to a close. <clears throat> and um, I look forward to the next episode whenever we um, get around to doing it. Thank you for watching um, and I hope you enjoyed that uh, that chat and if you did would you press the like button and also um, the uh, the subscribe button that would be great and if you wanted to be given alerts to when the next one is happening just press the bell button. Um, if you want to put any comments or any questions underneath here, underneath the video, please do. And at some point I will um, re-interview Mike, as it were, and put some of these questions to him. So um, I look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you.